Well, we can start, I guess, because we have a small subject, and this doesn't have a huge legal background. But this doesn't mean that it is illegal, of course. Uh, to complete legal, it's more about diplomacy, it's more about politics. What we're going to talk today is about how to settle disputes through peaceful ma uh, means. First of all, we study international relations and international law, and it has one purpose, of course. Here we're not teaching you how to make wars, but we're teaching how to avoid wars. So the basic aim of international law and international politics is finding peaceful solutions to disputes. At this point, what we have to clarify is what a dispute is. You already have a picture of what a dispute is actually. It's conflict. It's a disagreement. That disagreement can be about a fact that can be about opinions, that can be about the legal nature of uh, certain subjects. And in order to, by the way, most of you are studying international law, uh, sorry, international relations, and you have already studied the theories of international relations. The basic of those series, as you remember, realism, liberalism, they teach us that the entire international system, the platform, is composed of anarchy. <coughs> and according to realism, actually, disputes, conflicts are unavoidable. Or that can only be avoided when there's balance of power. Do I agree with that? And how is that in liberalism about conflicts? More yes. interconnectedness to uh, ensure that there's less conflict. Good point. Anything that you want to add? Uh, maybe uh, that is the main point, but maybe as an addition, uh, institutionalism and uh, state socialization will also uh, enable these states to manage that. True. Therefore, as a result, we can say that according to liberal school, uh, the conflicts can be managed. Conflicts are manageable. Then we have to ask the question, how to manage the problems, how to manage the disputes, the conflicts. According to international law, we have two methods to manage international disputes. We have diplomatic procedures to implement and we have legal procedures, adjudication. And let's start with this, uh, perhaps, the legal background or the source of those ideas. According to UN Charter, all member states are called upon to solve their disputes through peaceful means. That's why we have the United Nations, actually. It is there to ensure peace and security, to promote human rights, protect human rights. Therefore, a peaceful uh, platform is offered to the world by this system. And therefore, UN Charter calls states to solve their disputes through peaceful methods. In accordance with that, a treaty, a declaration was done actually, about uh, the principles of friendly relations and cooperation in between states in 1970. According to this declaration, there are four diplomatic solution methods for disputes. Those solution methods are already known to you. Negotiation, inquiry, conciliation, and mediation. The first four are the diplomatic methods. First four are political solution methods to the problems. It also mentions arbitration and judicial settlement. Those two are legal solution methods. So, legal solution methods are the binding ones. And the other four are non-binding methods. You could follow everything until this point, right? You have a question? Yeah. Are the non-binding? Non-binding ones are the first four of them. Like negotiation, inquiry, mediation, and conciliation are political or diplomatic solution methods. Judicial settlement 
arbitration, those two, are legal settlement methods. Well, we have always uh, emphasized one thing. Normally, in domestic systems, it's unacceptable that political uh, influences can get into legal system. But as for the international law, this is unavoidable. International law is somehow dominated by international politics. Therefore, the influence of politics is inevitable in creation of the problems and, of course, the solution of the problems. And legal system is also based upon that. So political influences shape the legal system as well. Therefore, those political, those diplomatic solutions have to be evaluated in line with the entire political context. That can be the domestic political context of one state, of one party of that dispute. That can be the political context of the region. Or that can be the uh, world order, the entire international system, entire uh, economic system, the global trade system, for instance. So you cannot evaluate the disputes in a vacuum. And let's start with the diplomatic solution methods. Uh, well, they're all known to you. We have all used those uh, in our sentences until today, like negotiation. Um, the nuclear crisis with Iran has started in 2002, and it has lasted until, well, it still continues on one hand. On the other hand, uh, the Joint Cooperation Plan of Action was concluded in 2016 which indicates us a 14 years of negotiation in between Iran and P5 plus 1. So Perm 5 of uh, United Nations Security Council plus Germany kept their negotiations with Iran for 14 years. This means that negotiations were not successful for a long time. And the subject is actually about nuclears about explosives, about weapons of mass destruction. Uh, in, the, in that 14 years, anything could happen. But still, the parties decide to stick upon diplomatic solution. And therefore, they continued. And it had been fruitful. At the end, they have reached an agreement. Of course, you can say that then why did Trump withdraw from the agreement? That's something else. Uh, but that's how it has happened, or mediation. Even though we don't hear about that a lot in recent years, Turkey's model role in the Middle East, that was quite typical in our politics. Turkey's mediation role in Middle Eastern conflicts was something that we popularly heard. Inquiry is not well known uh, among the public because it is more technical. And conciliation is partially known. Let's visit them all one by one. What you have to keep in mind is that there are diplomatic solution methods, therefore they are non-binding. So when there is a negotiation, it does not promise always a solution. Negotiation or if there is a mediation activity, it is, we just hope that it would be fruitful at the end. But they can reach an agreement, I mean, not a written agreement, but they can uh, find common denominators, but later the parties can change their minds, and that's completely okay, because those methods are non-binding methods of dispute settlement. So negotiation is the most basic one, easiest one. There is one dispute, and the parties of the dispute are also there, and they're talking to each other about the dispute. Uh, they reflect their own perspectives, and they try to understand what the other party wants, what the nature of the dispute is. Uh, that can be in form of round table, that can be in form of uh, conference, that can be just uh, speaking between the leaders, or that can be about talks in different levels, in ministerial level, for instance, in between diplomats, in between technocrats, depending upon the nature of the dispute. 
Here we do not come across with any kind of third parties. So parties of the dispute are there face to face. And this is the most popular one. This is the most easy one, actually. Therefore, this is mostly opted. So when there is a dispute, the first move is trying negotiation. That parties come together and talk about their problem. As we have mentioned in the crisis of Iran, it does not always promise us a solution. Well, anything can happen as a result. Sometimes, if there is an obligation, if there is a binding thing in between the states, like an agreement, <coughs> UNCLOS, for instance, if both uh, parties of the dispute are parties to UNCLOS, 82, then UNCLOS says that as soon as a dispute arises, the parties of the dispute shall start negotiations with each other. So because it is already mentioned in the treaty text, negotiation becomes a duty. It is not optional in that sense. I guess you have no questions related to negotiation. Do you? Yes, please. A United Nations Convention on the Law of Seas. 1982. Then we can talk about mediation. Mediation is also known as good offices. Some scholars tend to uh, study good offices and mediation as two different methods, but under international public law, it is better to mention them as if they mean the same thing. This is a third party settlement. So there is a dispute. And there are parties of the dispute, and they have probably tried negotiation, but they cannot talk to each other in a proper way, or the tensions are so high so that they have to break the negotiations. Then a third party steps in, just like in international, uh, interpersonal communication. When a couple fights with each other that they're not talking to each other anymore, one respected person by two of them, of course, steps in, talks to the parties, brings them together, or persuades them to talk to each other about their problem. But as you can guess, that third party has to be trusted by both of the parties. This is also the case in international relations. We're talking about the uh, entrance of a third party, but that third party has to be equally trusted by both uh, parties of the dispute. Then the mediator can fulfill their uh, duty. What that third party is doing is preparing a floor, a platform, on which parties can come together. What else? The third party is trying to encourage the parties of the dispute to talk to each other. The third party can be offering alternatives. The third party can be giving advices. But what third party is doing is never binding. It can just work if the third party is respected by both of the parties of the dispute. And it becomes quite handy, actually, if there were negotiations in beforehand and they were halted because of certain tensions. Then the third party is quite handy in bringing those tensions down. This is how it works. So the third party here in mediation is not a decision maker, okay? The third party is not making any decisions. The third party is not making any binding resolutions. The third party is just using its good intentions, cordial, amicable relations with all parties of the dispute to bring them together. When Palestinian and Israeli leaders are not getting in touch with each other, then a third party uh, starts a conference in their own state. Because if it's going to be in Jerusalem, if it's going to be in Tel Aviv, whatever can be problematic, then uh, imagine like Camp David or Turkey says that, okay, we can prepare your floor in Ankara. So this is an unbiased place. And uh, 
we encourage you finding a solution. You can try once again because you have come so close to a decision. Therefore, why are you losing that spirit at this moment? And let us host you in our country and hold some talks. It's like that. This is mediation. Any questions related to mediation? Then we can move to inquiry. Inquiry is again a non-binding method and it is again a third party solution. Inquiry is about finding the facts. It is more technical for this reason. Uh, when an accident happens, let's say, in high seas, Actually, there's such a case, I guess I have added this to my slides, the Duggar Bank incident. Uh, that, that's actually a very old incident that has happened in 1904, 1907, I don't remember well. What I remember is that British Navy was, no, it was not like that, that was the Russian Navy. And they come across with the British fisher fleet. And they have mistaken the fisher fleet with the Japanese Royal Navy. And they thought that Japanese Royal Navy is getting ready for something. To prevent that happening, they have started a fire on the fisher fleet. They have given huge damages to the ships, plus killed some people. And Brits thought that actually that was an action against Britain. And Russian Navy was saying that, no, we made a mistake and we have mistaken the fleet for the Japanese uh, Royal or Imperial Navy, but UK was not persuaded. And suddenly it has become, I mean, it's bringing both of the countries to the brink of war, of course. And the Russians are saying that, no, we're not trying to make war with you. It was an accident. So if they're lying, if that's an accident, or if they were willing uh, to give harm to the fishermen of the UK. Then what has to be done is that finding the fact. Who was there? What kind of flags? For instance, Russian Navy has said that, well, there were some uh, flags on that fishery boat, and we believe that actually Japanese has uh, made those fishermen to put them so that they could be mistaken. So there were some bad intentions. Someone had to clarify what the reality is, what the fact is, who was where, at what point, and how the fire was started, what was the target, and if it was targeted on British, if it was targeted on Japanese. Sometimes measurements are necessary, sometimes observers are necessary, sometimes certain records needs, uh, are needed to be found. So the fact needs to be found out. And who is going to be in that inquiry? That can be a commission, that can be one person, by the way. The commission can be composed of technicians, that can be composed of engineers, that can be composed of bureaucrats, that can be composed of diplomats or politicians, depends on the nature of this uh, dispute. And what they're trying to do is finding evidence, preparing a report, and they submit their inquiry report on both parties of the dispute, so that they can at least agree on the facts, what really has happened. And then still, if necessary, they need to pay compensation, they need to apologize, or they need to uh, take certain steps to improve the situation and settle the amicable relations once again, the cordial relations once again. This is the job of the inquiry. It is non-binding, it is more technical, it is not very popular and widespread, as you can guess, because of the nature of the uh, incident, of course. Any questions related to inquiry? Then I guess I can move to conciliation. Again, conciliation is a third party settlement. It is non-binding. And conciliation is somehow a preventive method. But it's also a solution, a dispute settlement method, but it can also work as a preventive measure. How it happens is that it is just like the Anand plan prepared for Cyprus. 
Northern Cyprus, Southern Cyprus, and they are trying to find a solution for their dispute. And Kofi Annan has been observing what has been happening in between. And without calling the parties of the dispute, Kofi Annan has prepared a roadmap for the solution of the dispute. And he has submitted papers to both parties. And those papers did not include the very same things. So it was full of advisors on the northern part, some advisors for the southern part, and the common roadmap as, as well. Uh, first of all, the parties, so north and south, they need to take certain, uh, let's say, friendly steps to show that they have good intentions. And then they should start contacting with each other. And perhaps they're a lot confused in those long years. Therefore, Kofenon has tried to clarify what actually the elements of the disputes are. So a list was prepared. What the real problem at the moment is this, this, and that. So what you have to concentrate is, first of all, those elements. And if you can come to terms with each other about those terms, uh, about those elements, then you should start talks about X subject, Y subject, Z sub subject as a result. So there was a roadmap. Well, that was more uh, concentrated on finding a solution to the dispute. But it also happens when the tensions are rising, before a war happens, a third party is trying to prevent that happening, then talks to the parties or prepares a roadmap saying that uh, you're not on a good uh, path. And this is about to be derailed before any kind of war happens, before any kind of uh, conflict takes place, you better start talking to each other without losing your sight. And those are the steps that you should better follow. This is definitely not binding. This is something like an advice. And uh, this is a well-formulated roadmap, a plan. Do you have any questions until here? Yes, Meza. I didn't really understand the difference of constellation between inquiry or mediation. I, yeah, okay, I got the mediation, but I didn't get the difference. Tell me what mediation does, first of all. Okay, there was a like, dispute between mm -hmm. two uh, parties. parties. It's definitely non-binding, and it is just like Turkey calling Palestinian and Israeli leaders to Ankara. Okay. Says that, well, you cannot solve it in Jerusalem, you cannot solve it in Gaza, whatever. Come to Ankara, remain here for one week, and uh, the mediator talks to both of the parties, makes advices to both of them, and this is how it happens. In conciliation, you don't need to talk to the parties. It can also be a very passive observer of the dispute and does not ask for the opinions of the parties. Depending upon their own observation, they prepare a roadmap about the solution. They offer certain solution steps and solution methods. But for instance, Kofi Annan does not uh, invite the leaders to uh, UN headquarters or what. Okay, just make, prepare the plan, submit it, do it as you wish. And inquiry, what does inquiry propose? It's a fact-finding thing. It's, about, it's, it's quite technical. It's finding the reality on an accident, on an event, what really has happened, what, the re what really the problem is. Uh, dam is damaged in Turkey, and Turkey says that, let's say, uh, it was not Daesh, it was the army of Assad. So someone has to clarify, first of all. 
uh, it was done, it was shot from the Syrian territories, and that's true, let's say, um, the material used in that explosive was stolen from the Ar Assad's army, but it was stolen by the terrorists. So someone has to clarify and provide evidence related to what really has happened. All right? Yes? Kind of. Kind of. But we don't name it like that, but kind of, yes. Who uh, is the, uh, the, the third party or... Uh the third party. The third party does the investigation. If the parties of the dispute are involved, then this can be biased. The third party has always objectivity. It is always unbiased, impartial, therefore trusted. If the parties do not trust the inquiry commission, then they don't take the inquiry commission's report seriously, of course. All right? If you don't have any questions related to four diplomatic solution methods, then I want to move to the binding methods of dispute settlement. There are two binding uh, dispute settlement methods. It is arbitration and adjudication. What's arbitration in Turkish? Tahkim. And arbitrator is? Say it louder. Ha? Huh? Hakim or Hakem? Which one? Hakem. Hakem. Okay, good. Uh, once we mention judicial solution method, once we mention adjudication, this means we're actually making references to international courts. The most prominent international court is the ICJ, International Court of Justice, and you're already quite knowledgeable about ICJ. ICJ is one of the six main organs of the United Nations. When is that created, ICJ? In which year? No, my goodness. Nope. ICJ is created in, it is 73 years old, which makes it was born in 46. In 45, UN Charter was uh, established, founded. And one annex of UN Charter is the ICJ Statute. That annex dates back to 46, and it establishes the International Court of Justice. Before UN was established, what was there? League of Nations. The League of Nations. And it already had a very similar branch, actually, the Permanent International Court of Justice, and it was still a branch of League of Nations. So the same spirit continues by the UN, ICJ is a branch of United Nations, and as you know, at the moment, uh, I was about to say 193, but I'm not quite sure. I guess the number has uh, risen. So a huge number of states are party to the UN and to ICJ statute. Therefore, ICJ is also referred as the World Court. I'm sure you have heard of that as well. In the World Court, or in the ICJ, we come across with 15 judges. Those 15 judges, all of them are coming from diverse nations. This means you never come across with two judges coming from Somalia. Uh, actually, in the ICJ statute, we do not come across with sentences saying that there must be equality in between genders or so, but they're trying to keep the number up. At the moment, I guess there are three female judges and the rest are males. And uh, what they're trying to have in that uh, group of judges is that different legal systems, different perspectives are represented there, different civilizations are represented there, and there is a geographical diversity. So there is one representative from Asia, one representative from Africa, one from Pacific, uh, continental Europe, Eastern Europe, Latin America, uh, they have to be there. And who can make applications by ICJ? Definitely, just states. And the United Nations. international organizations. States and organizations can make applications by the ICJ. How about individuals? No. Individuals cannot. And ICJ is actually there for two reasons. It is trying to solve contentious cases 
And it is also trying to solve, no, it's not trying to solve, actually, it is giving advisory opinions. Giving the advisory opinion, 15 states come together and they are trying to establish an international organization. What they have to do is all organizations are established by one treaty we have said. This means they are supposed to uh, write a treaty. They prepare a draft text, but they're not quite sure if that text is prepared properly, if that text is somehow in contradiction with the existing international laws and norms, what they do is they submit their text to ICJ and they ask for advisory opinions, if they're interpreting international law property or not. This is giving advisory opinion. As for contentious, do you know what contentious case mean? Good. When parties cannot decide upon the solution, so they want different things from each other. All right? Contentious cases are when the parties of the dispute cannot uh, decide upon the terms of the solution. The thing is that normally in domestic legal systems, if I'm mad at you, if you have given damage to me, what I do is I go to the police or I visit the state prosecutor and I bring my evidences with and I tell about my complaint. They prepare a paper, they evaluate my complaint and if they believe that my complaint uh, can turn into a court case, they start a court case against you. Until this point, you don't know that I have gone to the state prosecutor. Then the court sends you a letter saying that you are expected to the court on this date because of this and that reasons. This is how it happened. It is never the case in the international system. It is not just like Turkey is mad at Georgia, therefore goes to the court, talks to the state prosecutor, and then court calls Georgia. No. In ICJ contentious cases, if Turkey and Georgia cannot solve their problem, then both of them have to agree that they're bringing the case to ICJ. So for contentious cases in ICJ, consent is again the key element. The parties of the dispute should uh, show consent about bringing the issue to ICJ. And ICJ makes a decision as a result. Those 15 judges, here's the case, and the states are defended by who? They have their own state lawyers. The thing is that, is it possible for Turkey to defend themselves in Turkish? What do you think? The answer is no. The working language of ICJ is English and French. This is how it works. So all applications are made in English or French, and defense is also done in English and French. And uh, among those 15 lawyers, uh, among those 15 judges, I'm sorry, let's imagine there is no Turkish judge and there is no Georgian judge. What happens is that Turkey and Georgia are allowed to appoint their ad hoc judges for once. Only one judge? Yes, each one judge. And it is not a must that Turkey appoints a Turkish judge. If Turkey trusts uh, one, let's say, Pakistani judge, then it is also possible. The most important thing is that the judge is appointed by one of the parties of the dispute. And this judge is not co uh, continuing to work with the ICJ. It is an ad hoc judge. This means that judge is only there for this one specific case. And when the case is concluded, then the judge leaves the ICJ as well. Well, 
The parties of the dispute must show consent. Therefore, and as a result of their action, ICJ starts a court case and at the end makes a decision. This decision is completely binding. And this decision cannot be brought to appeals. Do you know what appeals is? What an appeals court is? So normally, if I'm not happy in my domestic national system with one court decision, I'm allowed to bring this decision to one higher court, like Yargıta Intrigue. So uh, the decision is seen once again by the judges. In ICJ, the decision is final. The decision is completely binding, and this is not a surprise for the parties of the dispute. They already know that if ICJ makes a decision, it's going to be binding. Therefore, their consent is asked. If they cannot take that risk, then they simply don't bring the issue to ICJ. So this is how ICJ works. ICJ is governed by international law. So while solving the international disputes, ICJ is using four sources that you have learned in the very beginning of this lecture. As you remember, ICJ statute, article, tell 38. me, 38, tells us that the primary sources are Treaty. treaties and customs. customs. And there are secondary sources, which are the general principles of law, teachings, and decisions, judicial decisions. So this is how ICJ makes its decisions, by using those four sources mentioned in the statute of ICJ, Article 38. And in international arbitration, international arbitration is much more relaxed. Um, arbitrator can be one person, arbitrator can be a group of people. Arbitrator is chosen by the parties of the dispute. If you remember, as we were talking about the law of seas, I've told you that harbors are internal waters and um, States are allowed to close them. And that uh, dates back to 1800s, back to a dispute in between Argentina and UK. And Argentina, the harbor in Buenos Aires, that was closed. And British army, uh, not the army, uh, ships asked Argentina to open them. They were against. And at the end, they have decided to appoint the Chilean president as the arbitrator. So the parties decide upon who the arbitrator is going to be. And here we have said that there are certain sources that ICJ can make their decisions accordingly. In international arbitration, the solution or the sources or what can be done, which procedures shall be followed, they are all predetermined by the parties of the dispute. Therefore, it is quite flexible. And they prepare something like a contract, a treaty in between, saying that we are appointing this person as our arbitrator. If the arbitrator agrees with that, of course, it is not a surprise that, oh, I become an arbitrator. I didn't know anything about that. It is not like that. The person or the group or the state or the international organization is contacted. Their consent is already taken, and they prepare a contract or a treaty about the procedures, about who the arbitrator is going to be, and uh, how the process is going to be followed. It is undersigned. It becomes binding. As a result, the arbitrator makes a decision, and this decision becomes completely binding because the parties have already show consent for the upcoming decision. Could you follow everything? Yes? I could understand why they need to appoint a judge. If they
they are willing to, it is not a necessity, but if they are willing to, because all those judges represent different legal systems. Common legal system, for instance, custom legal system, civil legal system, all judges are coming from different parts of the world. And according to the one dispute, if the states are willing to reflect their own perspective as well to that judge's commission, then they can. But it is not a must. All right? Any other questions? No? You could follow everything well. Then? No, not this time. <laughs> no, not this time. But soon, of course. You still have two quizzes to go. The one I have conducted was an attendance quiz. Yes. Have a good day. <laughs>